When thinking about some of the classic fairy tales, we often think of European tales of princesses and gallant knights. But what is the ultimate American fairy tale? The one that has enchanted children for generations with its magical land, talking animals, and scary witches. That would be L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. The first book alone has become cherished for obvious reasons, with its odd assortment of characters and the highly imaginative world he created and continued to write about over many sequels. The Wizard of Oz is offbeat, scary, unique, and unflinching in the dangers that encounter Dorothy in her attempts to return back home to Kansas. So much of this is also illustrated through the drawings by W. W. Denslow. Most people know the story of Dorothy Gale, a young girl from Kansas who finds herself transported to Oz on a cyclone and is joined by a scarecrow, a tin woodsman, and a lion as they travel through the land to seek help from the Wizard of Oz. Each character has their own goals, with their motivations coming from a different place, whether it's the scarecrow with his search for a brain, or the lion desperately in need of some courage. Yet it's Dorothy, not the wizard, who helps them achieve these accomplishments. Had she not been whisked to Oz, she would not have encountered the trio and inspired them to see the wizard. Another large reason for the appeal of the wonderful Wizard of Oz is the imaginative lands Dorothy comes across. Baum cleverly uses color to give each their own flavor and comes up with some wild ideas for them. There's a town full of porcelain dolls, the village inhabited by the munchkins, and the famed Emerald City, which may not be quite as green as its citizens think. However, the book is not as remembered for how gruesome and odd it got. For instance, there is a surprising amount of decapitation, including the Tin Woodsman's origin story. You heard me right. His lack of a heart has a tragic backstory, and Baum describes the entire ordeal in detail. Baum fills Oz with so many potential dangers for Dorothy, the Wicked Witch of the West, only really comes to play for a couple of chapters when the wizard orders her death and Dorothy is forced to be her slave. And each segment plays a key role in strengthening Dorothy and her friends, and that makes her inevitable departure all the more emotional. L. Frank Baum clearly took a lot of inspiration from his life in writing The Wizard of Oz, and the book provides a wonderful time capsule to the Americana of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Yet there's also some commentary here, but not in a way that dates the story. Its themes will continue to resonate for many years to come, and that also applies to the famous 1939 film adaptation. This movie has overshadowed the original source material in the years since its release, but while it does dial down some of the more twisted aspects of Baum's book and simplifies the story, it's nonetheless an enchanted film with its own charm and delights. Its entrance into the public lexicon is completely deserving, and quite a number of sequences could be argued as some of the most memorable in motion picture history. Judy Garland's performance of Over the Rainbow is instantly iconic. There's something magical about the whole sequence, even though it's merely Dorothy singing in a barnyard. And yet, it's easy to feel the emotion as she wonders if there exists life beyond her little farm in Kansas. The Technicolor is used to brilliant effect, especially when Dorothy enters Oz. And what continues to astound me is how, much like Baum's book, not a single scene or piece of dialogue is wasted. There is a lyrical quality in not just the songs, but the dialogue too. And this friendship really grows between Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Tinman, and the Cowardly Lion. The Wicked Witch's role is expanded from the book, and Margaret Hamilton digs into the role. This witch's appearance was changed heavily from the book, with the filmmakers opting to make her tall and green, a look that has become the default appearance for witches and even playing a key role in the popular stage musical Wicked. That's one of many elements from the film that's become almost synonymous with Oz and all future interpretations. Similarly, even though Baum never utilized the concept of characters in Kansas having Oz counterparts, that technique from the film adaptation has been copied in almost every other iteration. And to be honest, it works, and it shows why Dorothy would be so trustworthy of her new friends as she somehow senses something familiar about them. 
If you ever wondered why Dorothy tells the Scarecrow why she'll miss him most of all, it's because the original draft of the script had Dorothy and Hunk, the Scarecrow's Kansas counterpart, have feelings for each other. Another key decision the film made was the revelation that Oz was all a dream. The ending is beautiful and touching and ends the film on a happy note, but a part of me does wonder if this film would have been a little more special if the camera had panned down and showed the ruby slippers sitting underneath the bed. Speaking of which, in the original book the shoes are silver, but changing them to ruby makes more sense for them as it really highlights the technicolor magic of Oz. The Wizard of Oz is just one of those films where it's incredible how beautifully it's held up all these years, but it would not be the final time somebody would seek to bring the books to the big screen. In the mid-1950s, Walt Disney bought the rights to the remaining Oz books and sought to turn them into a movie musical, either for television or the big screen. It was never made, but Disney did eventually return to the property in the 1980s, shortly before the books entered the public domain. The result was Walter Murch's Return to Oz, which decided to go with a more thankful depiction of Baum's Oz, specifically the second and third books. That unsurprisingly threw a lot of people off, who were more familiar with the 1939 film and were expecting a straight sequel. The advertising did not help, as the trailer emphasized it would be just as colorful and cheery as the MGM musical. This summer, Walt Disney Pictures presents a motion picture fantasy adventure beyond your fondest imagination. You'll be transported miraculously back to the enchanted land of Oz, that magical kingdom beloved by young and old for generations. Instead, audiences were treated to a witch who could switch heads, horrifying monsters clay animated by Will Vinton, and most frightening of all, the wielders. <laughs> So many years later, those things are still scarier than any horror film. Yet, it may surprise people how much merch borrowed from the source material. Those aforementioned wheelers are just as freaky looking in the third book, Ozma of Oz, as they are in Return to Oz. And yet, that very aspect that turned off critics back in 1985 is oddly why Return to Oz continues to resonate for many, including myself. Merch does a good job of taking us back to Oz and showing how much decay it has fallen into. Feruza Balk brings the proper sense of fear and wonder to Dorothy, and the special effects still hold up tremendously. Return to Oz being set at Halloween also makes it a fitting film to watch during October. It's an impressively mounted production, and the new characters bring their own flavor to the land of Oz. It's endlessly creative, and yes, certainly a scary depiction of Oz, but also very in keeping with the tone of Baum's original writing. Disney would release another Oz film in 2013 with Oz the Great and Powerful, directed by Sam Raimi. While legally it's said to be a prequel to the books, the visuals and characters definitely owe a lot more to the 1939 film. Having recently watched Oz the Great and Powerful and The Wizard of Oz back to back, they managed to blend seamlessly together and one can imagine them taking place within the same universe. While James Franco's Oz is billed as the main character, I always found the film was really about the three witches and a conflict between a good witch, a bad witch, and a good witch who succumbs to evil. Following the footsteps of Wicked, this film paints an almost tragic backstory for the Wicked Witch of the West as she is continually manipulated by the Witch of the East. Theodora becomes an unfortunate pawn in her sister's plans to rule over Oz and the Emerald City. And throughout it all, I bought this circus magician as the future Wizard of Oz Dorothy would encounter many years later. The addition of the little China girl adds a further emotional layer to the story. The film does not take as many notes from Baum's books as it could have, but including the porcelain town was a nice touch for those of us who wondered how it could have been depicted had they included it in the 1939 film. While I wish Raimi embraced more of the weirdness of the source material, seeing as this is the same man behind the Evil Dead films, this clearly exists as his tribute to the classic movie rather than a true prequel to the books. And it works rather well in that regard, and I greatly appreciate this addition to the Oz canon. Aside from Oz the Great and Powerful and the occasional television series, it's surprising Hollywood 
seems to continually sit on something that could have serious franchise potential. I've wondered for years what a straight, non-musical, more faithful adaptation of the original book would be like. With today's technology and the right director, it could be something really special and show the side of Oz audiences are otherwise unfamiliar with. With the current obsession with lengthy franchises, Baum has so much material ripe for the picking. If done properly and with the right people involved, it would be completely magical. I can absolutely see Over the Garden Wall creator Patrick McHale doing an amazing adaptation, as his animated miniseries had a sense of fear and Americana-inspired look not unlike the Oz stories. This is something I've wanted to see Hollywood try for so long, and it would not be unlike the Harry Potter films, which show the potential of doing a film adaptation based on each book. Oh well. If your only familiarity with The Land of Oz is the MGM adaptation, you've only skimmed the surface. All of L. Frank Baum's Oz books are in the public domain, so they're not hard to get a hold of. Find them at your local library or bookseller, and prepare to be whisked away to an imaginative and magical world unlike anything you've ever seen before. See you next time.